course, we're continuing with our message series that we've entitled Whole Heart. And this morning, I want to start with a question. It's the title of the sermon, and that is, who do you listen to? Who do you listen to? Well, your first reaction might be, that's kind of silly. I listen to a lot of people. I listen to my spouse part of the time. Fellas, we have been accused of practicing selective hearing, and we probably are guilty, aren't we? You probably also say, I listen to my children, I listen to my mom and dad, my friends, my coworkers, even strangers. I do hear what others say to me. Well, y'all, obviously that's good. You see, why to be attentive when people speak? Because often they need help in the way of counsel or advice. Or when they relate information to us that's beneficial, we want to hold on to that, don't we? And yet, in getting beyond the everyday conversations and discussions that take place while we're at work or at home or where we spend time socially, whose voice are we hearing? Who are we allowing to influence us? Who are we really lending our ear to? Well, over the course of the last several weeks, we've been looking at the Old Testament character Saul, Israel's first king. And although God obviously saw in him tremendous potential, great upsides, we've come to discover that like us, he had a number of flaws and imperfections. A couple of weeks ago, Griffin talked about the baggage that Saul was carrying. In 1 Samuel 9, we see him struggling to come to terms with what he considered his less than impressive lineage and background. Y'all, at best, Saul was a reluctant servant, wasn't he? And that was so because he seemed genuinely shocked that God would choose him, a, a man from the smallest tribe and the smallest family within that tribe, from Israel. The bottom line was he did not see in himself what God saw in him. And then we see him grappling with the issue of control. Even though God had spoken through Samuel, the prophet, and he told Saul exactly how his plan to offer sacrifices would unfold, Saul took matters into his own hands and changed the plan. And it turned, about, turned out to be a terrible move, a foolish move. And then last week we saw how prideful Saul was after ignoring a direct command from God to destroy everything in battle against the Amalekites. He set up a monument to himself so that he could be honored for what he thought was this great accomplishment. And his sin was so great that God declared, I am grieved that I have made Saul king. Well, let's begin reading today in verse number 13. It says, when Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you, I've carried out the Lord's instructions. But y'all, in reality, he had not. God told him that none of the Amalekites or their livestock were to be spared in the battle. Saul's unwillingness to be submissive to God kind of reminds us that we can't obey God part of the way. Really, it's not obeying God at all. And all of us know what that's like. When I was growing up as a teenager, I shared a bedroom with my younger brother, nine years younger. And ladies, one guy in a room is a disaster, and then you add another to it, and it makes it even worse. Because young or old, we really are all pigs, aren't we? Our dear mother tolerated a lot, but when she could stand the sight and probably the smell no longer, she would order that our room be cleaned. We didn't clean anything. We took the clothes and the toys and shoved them underneath the bed or in the closet. And then when she came by, you know, to kind of do an inspection, we smiled at her to make her think we carried out her wishes. We're kind of that way with God sometimes, aren't we? We don't mind complying with his commands as long as they're easy and a pleasure to practice. But following through on what he's instructed us to do can be quite a different story when his words are hard or they make us feel uncomfortable. This is where Saul was. Verse 14, but Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle I hear? Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. 
Saul's comments are dripping with sarcasm. He might as well have said, you can't be serious. <laughs> when God calls him to justify his actions, Saul attempts to do so in two ways. First, he lays the blame on others. He's done that before, as Griffin talked about a few weeks ago. He does everything he can to put distance between himself and the soldiers under his charge. He was saying, don't look at me. They brought those animals here. I wonder if you've been tempted to pass the buck. <laughs> Instead of owning a decision you had input on or maybe made yourself, you pointed your finger elsewhere so that attention would be diverted away from you. Few things demonstrate that we're growing in our faith more, though, than being able to say and mean, this, one, this one's on me. The buck stops here. And then the second thing Saul does to justify his actions is claim his intentions are upright. <laughs> he was saying what they might have done was not exactly according to the letter of the law, but it was for a good cause. You see, they had God in mind. Well, as we'll see, God would not allow Saul to get away with that rationalization. Committing wrong to somehow do right never honors God, does it? Verse 16, stop, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul said. Samuel replies, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. He sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Make war on them until you've wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? Samuel reminds Saul that when God told him of his wishes to make him king, y'all, he was so humble. He was so unassuming. So no doubt in the beginning, he was very dependent upon God. But then his humility gives way to arrogance. Thinking he'd do things his way. And I have to worry about all those bothersome details. After all, God had handpicked him to be the first leader of his people. Surely then God would be lenient and give him room to operate as he saw fit. In other words, God would look the other way when Saul chose to step out of the established parameters. Power and influence will tempt us to think that way. You ever notice that? Coming into any supervisory role can be heady stuff. And if we're not careful, it will change us and sometimes not for the better. Something else that jumped off the page at me that I don't think I had ever noticed before and I've read through this passage like you have dozens of times in my life. And that's Samuel referring to Saul's neglect as evil, evil. Y'all, people routinely neglect what God says and think nothing of it. In their mind, it's no big deal. I've said for years that for some people being a Christian is no different than taking a, a trip to the grocery store. We go to Lowe's or Food Line or Walmart and we browse the aisles, choose what we want and leave the rest behind. But you see, God has already made so many decisions for us. Getting to pick some biblical principles to believe in and follow while we disregard those that we don't really is not an option. Now, of course, God can forgive us of that willful conduct. But when you look at the life of Saul, this has become a pattern, hasn't it? You see, over and over again, he refuses to obey the Lord. Verses 20 and 21, Saul continues to plead his case, but I did obey the Lord. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Saul's inability or unwillingness to acknowledge his role, his wrong, is just astonishing. 
He's blatantly defied God so many times that he's apparently become blind to the error of his way. Sin has a way of doing that to us. I have an old friend who's in ministry also, and years ago he said something that stuck with me. He said, sin makes us hard-hearted and hard-headed. Verse 22, Samuel replies, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance, like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Samuel holds nothing back in laying out God's case against this king who's gone rogue. He equated rebellion with witchcraft and arrogance with the worship of false gods. And of course, both of those activities, the Israelites were forbidden to take part in. Well, then using such strong, direct language, Samuel is letting Saul know that as vital as these outward rituals were, they cannot take the place of a heart that's right with God, which results in being willing to do as he says. Verse 24, then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the people, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. As persistent in his stubbornness as Saul was, he finally backs down and admits what has been driving his decision-making all along. And what's caused his life and his kingship to spiral so far downward. He was listening to others instead of listening to God. Now, a little bit of history might help here in Saul's defense. It was routine for the victors to keep some of the spoils or the plunder that they took in battle. And that the soldiers in Saul's army amped up the pressure to do that after they had defeated the Amalekites is a given. You know, somebody's always giving unsolicited advice to leaders. And yet it was no excuse for his choosing to be weak and bowing to their demands. God could not have been more clear in what he wanted from King Saul. You know, obviously, none of us will ever occupy a position as powerful and influential as that of Saul. But our lives matter. They're significant. And who we take our cues from says everything about us and even can determine the course of our life. So it's vital that we make up our mind who we're going to listen to, whose voice we're going to hear and allow to guide us. You see, if not, we're bound to put ourselves through the ringer trying to decide what we're going to do and more importantly, who we're going to be. Well, let's contrast the two paths. If we follow Saul's path and choose to listen to those around us, what do we gain? What is the benefit? Well, first of all, we will be popular. We will always have lots of friends. We don't know how long Saul held out on giving in to those that were encouraging him to do wrong. It could have been 30 seconds, five minutes, or five hours. But when he finally caved to their demand, he was probably declared a hero instantly. I can see them patting him on the back and giving him high fives, can't y'all? Here's what's really tragic. It seems that Saul's greatest fear was falling out of favor with the people that he was ruling. He either forgot or he neglected God's admonition to not follow the crowd in doing wrong. That's Exodus chapter 23 and verse 2. You know, we live in a culture that's just as relentless about their demands. Everywhere we turn, there seems to be another pressure campaign designed to force us 
believers into that mindset and that philosophy of life. You've heard the term group think. It applies primarily to the business world and describes making decisions within a very small group where personal creativity is discouraged and sometimes even suppressed. Y'all, if we decide to listen to and heed the voices of the world, what we might not realize is there's no such thing as opposing those voices ever. What we will become is yes, women and men who agree to toe the line regardless of how outrageous or sinful the idea just so that we can maintain our status and popularity. The second thing we gain if we follow Saul's path is no fear of mistreatment. We won't have to worry that we'll be persecuted for our faith. Had Saul not given his soldiers what they wanted, there's no telling how long he would have heard about it. They could have badgered and pestered him for days, weeks, or months. It's not hard to figure out what he was motivated by. You know, when we listen to and follow those around us, we go along to get along. And whether we realize it or not, it's what we sign up for and, and agree to. There's really no deviating. You see, such an agreement ensures that we won't be hassled or pressured. We can lay our head down on our pillow at night knowing that we don't have anything to be afraid of. If some of us are struggling with this, we need to know that there's a different path, a more noble path. You see, instead we can vow to ourselves and God that we will listen to and obey him above every other voice. That yes, even when conflicted, when bombarding, uh, bombarded by these competing voices, we can do what he says. Well, if we follow God's path, choose to listen to him, what is it we gain? What's the benefit? Well, first of all, we gain blessings. All throughout Scripture, we're assured of God's blessings if we follow His commands and principles. It's the promise that God will simply look after us and take care of us because we're willing to do what is right. This term blessed also means that we'll be happy. In other words, overall, we'll experience peace of mind because we did what God led us to and what God stands for. Several years ago, Jane and I attended a wedding, and at the reception afterwards, we got to visit with some church members and friends. In a conversation with one of those people, a lady related that she had recently been pressured by someone higher up in the company to do something that wasn't right. She didn't get into details, but rather than compromise her faith and morals, she resigned from her position. The other day when I asked her to refresh my memory about that experience, she sent me this message. Very stressful time. So happy not to have burdens of that sort now. So easy to get caught up in doing what is deemed popular and easy. I stood my ground, but it was hard and not financially advantageous. But then listen, no regrets. No regrets. Folks, our sister in Christ is reaping the rewards of God's blessings. Psalm chapter 1 and verse 1 says, Blessed is the man or woman who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his, her delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he, she meditates day and night. God says we are blessed when we're, we're happy, when we take in his word, listen to his voice, and choose to follow him. 
Well, what else do we gain if we listen to God? What is the benefit? Well, we gain strength. Verse 3 from that same Psalm 1 passage, he or she is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he or she does prospers. When you come to the New Testament, the life of God that's within us is described by Jesus as rivers of living water, meaning that when we're planted deeply in God and stay rooted in Him, what we receive and give out is His strength. And you see, when we possess that, we can stand strong in the face of adversity and be loyal to God in any and all circumstances. We can more than withstand the disapproval of those who do not have our best interest at heart. Y'all think about this for just a moment. It takes no intestinal fortitude, no backbone, and no conviction to be like Saul. Is there anything that he would not have done to win the, the approval of his people? If that is what we choose to live for, you need to know that you'll never get enough of it. People pleasing has no limits. One of the most ruthless tyrants the world's ever known found this the hard way. After Jesus was arrested, falsely accused, and condemned to death by his own people, he was taken to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. And while standing before his accusers, Jesus was questioned at length by Pilate, but Jesus made little to no attempt to defend himself. The Bible says this happened while the Passover feast was going on. And during that festival, it was the custom of Rome to release a prisoner. This was their way of showing generosity and trying to keep some peace. Well, the, tra the crowd that day began to shout that they wanted Barabbas set free. He had actually tried to overthrow Rome, and he was a murderer. And Mark's gospel indicates that Pilate knew Jesus was not guilty of the charges leveled against him. He realized it was out of envy that the Jewish leaders had turned against Jesus. And yet when Pilate attempted to release Jesus instead of Barabbas, the ravenous crowd began to demand Jesus' crucifixion. Over and over again, they called for his execution. And although Pilate was convinced of Jesus' innocence, Mark says, wanting to satisfy the crowd... Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. This man, who everybody thought was so mighty, in reality was vulnerable. All because he was afraid of what others would think and how he thought they would react. When I was a student at Johnson University, Dan Garrett was a guest lecture in one of my youth ministry classes. Dan was a youth minister himself then. And in his remarks, he addressed the subject of peer pressure. Students succumbing to what others would try and talk them into doing that they might not do on their own. And then when he got to the end, he said he thought peer pressure was exaggerated, <laughs> overblown. Because in the end, we really do wind up doing ultimately what we want to do. And y'all, that is absolutely the truth. You see, in the end, we make our own decisions. The question is, do we want to go along with what everybody else is doing? Or do we want to hear and respond to the voice of God? Do we desire the approval of others or the approval of God? Who do we listen to? When I was in youth ministry, I had this conversation with students very often. I encouraged those that I was working with to be sensitive to the Lord's leading and shun both their fear of and applause of people. And I talked with them about this at such a young age because I knew what was just over the horizon, what was coming. We get to be adults, we get set in our ways as we say here in the South. 
And I knew if they started down the road of pleasing people or being afraid of what others thought, it could become a way of life, a driving force that would be very difficult to part with. Sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that things will get easier as we get older. But in reality, it's just the opposite. So my encouragement was to start now. I would say, start now by taking a stand. You see, I knew that God would build in them his confidence if they took that step of faith and stood strong so that they could hear God's voice above all others. I wonder if some of us this morning are there right now. You may be having trouble hearing God clearly because you're inclined to listen to the other voices that clamor for your attention. Or you may be caught between who God is calling you to be and wanting to fit in with your friends who aren't Christ followers. You're here in worship, so you're being spoken to by the Lord. And in those moments, you get inspired and you get fired up. And then when you leave here, you want to win the world, you know. But then out in the world, you're hearing another message. And it's actively trying to lure you away from him and undermine your faith. So there's this constant tug of war, and it's not just on your psyche, but it's on your soul. If you're ready to give your whole heart to God, and you sincerely want to listen to him and his direction for your life. Here are just a couple of action points really for us all. First, let's care more about what God thinks than what people think. Since we bear the image of our creator, God is the one that we are here to please and to serve. Centuries ago, the prophet Jeremiah wrote the following, This is what the Lord says, Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who depends on flesh for his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. He will be like a bush in the wastelands. He will not see prosperity when it comes. He will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the man or the woman who trusts in the Lord and whose confidence is in him. He would be like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Folks, please care about what God thinks and trust in him. And then second, let's serve God faithfully regardless of the decision of others. Y'all, I wish I could tell you that if you move toward God today, that your friends and family members and co-workers would do likewise. I cannot. But this is one decision that we can be completely selfish about. You see, we can become a disciple of Jesus without taking anybody else into consideration because it's right. A lot of voices are vying for our attention. And yes, even our loyalty. But only one voice is worthy of our allegiance. And that is the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you listen to him and will you come to him? Well, our band is going to come in just a moment and play a closing song. Griffin and myself will be down at the front. If you have questions about your faith, if you're ready to give your, your life to Christ, whatever's going on with you, it would be more than our pleasure to discuss that with you. Well, let's pray together. God, thank you for speaking above all others. Thank you for making so clear to us the direction that you want our lives to go in. Thank you for your great compassion, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for how you have blessed us with this opportunity to become a child of yours. 
Lord, the voices that buy for our attention and clamor for it are constant. And so many of those voices would pull us away from you. So God, today we pray for clarity. That we be willing, even if no one else is, to hear your voice above all others. And to choose to obey you and follow you no matter the consequences, no matter the outcome. Because, Lord, it's right and it's good. And thank you, Lord, for calling us to this. And it's what we pray in Jesus' name.